Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to interrupt your discussions. Um, that tells us that you want to do more networking and ask more questions. And that's exactly what we're really planning to do in this session. Um, it really is a conversation with um, a great entrepreneur, Rose, um, who will be sharing her journey with us all. Um, but we really do want it to be a conversation, not just between the two of us, uh, but also with all of you in the room. So at any point, if either Rose or I say something and you want to go deeper um, into that particular topic, please stick your hand up and uh, we'll take the questions as we go along. So really attempting to have a genuine conversation. So Rose, thank you. I remember when we first met and we had a brilliant discussion um, about a whole host of different things. But perhaps you could sort of start off by telling us just a little bit about yourself, what you did before you became an entrepreneur, what made you jump into running your own business. Okay, um, do I do I need this microphone? So thanks for asking me. Actually, we were we we, we met the first time with Madeline. So Madeline, thank you for making that introduction. Um, so maybe before I say like, what, what did I do before um, Systematic Edge? Maybe I just say a little bit about like, what does Systematic Edge do, right? So Systematic Edge is a licensed type four and nine asset manager here in Hong Kong. Uh, and we, um, uh, uh, we do two things. One is we do investment solutions for um, high net worth individuals, families and family offices. And uh, on the other side, we do currency risk and cash management solutions for those same clients, but also for small and medium sized businesses, which is really what we're gonna talk about today, right? Uh, and uh, so what, what are the two pain points that we're solving for? Well, so the two pain points are, one, we wanna minimize the costs that are dragging on financial assets. And the second is we wanna maximize the returns on those financial assets for our clients. Okay, so that's what we do. Those are the pain points we're solving for. Now, how did it all get started? Okay, so um, I started my uh, career at uh, Hydric and Struggle. So uh, I'm uh, executive search by background. Rest assured, I do not run portfolio management at Systematic Edge. Um, and uh, so I <laughs> so so I ran, um, I ran a couple of uh, different teams. I was a partner, uh, so I ran our financial markets teams and our infrastructure team, which is all about back office. But my co-founder, who does run portfolio management, at the same time that I was doing that, he was working in an investment bank and running a trading team, okay? And so what were the two things that we were seeing that made us want to start Systematic Edge? Well, one was the clients or the clients that I was talking to and, and our experience in the market was that those traditional financial services firms, no disrespect for BMO and, and the rest, but we're looking at a totally different market, um, were um, they really wanted to transform and leverage technology. But the, the execution of that was very, very difficult because of legacy issues, right? Legacy tech legacy culture and all of those things. So that's what we were seeing per, uh, professionally. But personally, what were we seeing? We were seeing, um, of course, we, uh, we had traditional financial services firms managing our wealth and we were disappointed with performance and uh, cost and uh, ex access to expertise. So because of those things, um, that's why we started Systematic Edge. And we wanted to address the two pain points I talked about by leveraging technology and quantitative finance. Okay, so that's how we came ab about. But, you know, Systematic Edge started with one product, one solution, investment solution. And by talking to our clients, so I think one of the panelists said this before, you have to talk to your clients. By talking to our clients and looking at the, the, the needs of our own family business, we built out our investment solutions, our currency risk management solutions, and our cash management solutions um, for our clients. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the journey. But like you said, we're here to talk about uh, what we're seeing in the market, yeah? Yeah, and how did that journey lead you to setting up the business here in Hong Kong rather than elsewhere? And in the sort of spirit of the openness, what's been the good, the bad, and the ugly about setting up a business and running a business in Hong Kong? Um, I'm sure it's not been totally plain sailing. So um, share with us you know, what's worked really well, but also where you've maybe had some hurdles that you've had to overcome. Um, well, we started uh, Systematic Edge in Hong Kong because that's where we were living. 
okay, uh, quite frankly, but also this is a great place to live. So we'll talk about, you know, I mean, that's, I think that's a, really, that's a really important point. In addition to that, in terms of getting licensing, setting up a business, which is, you know, very easy to navigate, um, uh, this, is, this is a great place um, to set that business up. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know, I can talk about, um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the things that we see with our clients as well. Uh, in terms of uh, of advice, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, for you, because you see a lot of companies, why do you think they set up here? Um, well, I think ultimately businesses obviously set up where they think they could make money. And uh, I think um, certainly as Invest Hong Kong, which is the department of the Hong Kong government, we see those opportunities right here in the city, obviously more broadly in the Greater Bay Area, the rest of the country. Um, and then for many of the businesses we work with, also in terms of accessing um, the markets of ASEAN, uh, and for some they look even further afield. Um, so I sort of have this image in my mind of sort of growing concentric circles of opportunity, and depending upon the business, um, you're tapping into one or more of um, those opportunities. Um, then it's the stuff about ease of doing business, it's easy to set up here. Um, the talent pool, I know there's some challenges around talent right now, um, but, but that's generally um, what I see as the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so, okay, uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the learnings we had along the way, shall I, shall I talk about that? Yeah. Um, okay, so, but this is really like on the ground learning for people that actually want to set up in Hong Kong, is, you know, for financial services firms, you think that you need to have your office in Admiralty and Central, right? Um, and, uh, but during COVID, nobody was meeting anybody. Right, so you know, all of a sudden, when our lease came up, because we were in Admiralty, of course, just like everybody else, where you know we thought, mm, we'll look a little farther afield, um, and we realized that like two steps down the South Island Line and Wong Chuk Hang, we could get three times the space for the same amount of money. So I think people have the 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 image that Hong Kong is so expensive in terms of real estate, but the reality is there's a lot of options here. So that was that was one learning along the way for us. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's certainly something we see at Invest Hong Kong, and we talk to um, clients about that whole range of the options. Some want um, prestige, you know, the the address. Um, others are more pragmatic. Um, but really, there is something for every business if you look at the whole of the landmass of Hong Kong. What one thing that I um, picked up actually on the earlier panel that I wanted to sort of reinforce really was around this risk of failing to localize and, and if you're bringing the business in really thinking very carefully about how you fit into whether it's hong kong china or the regional markets um, by tailoring your product or your service that really then leads i think to getting the right people and that key point about empowering them don't tie them up in knots so they can't make decisions um, that really respond to talking to clients and you know, clearly that's something that you do in terms of developing the portfolio of the business. What One of the things I'm intrigued about is your sort of, through the clients you work with, you get some sites of supply chains. Supply chains are quite a big issue globally. We hear lots of politicians and the media talking about reshoring, nearshoring, regional supply chains. What's the reality you see when you're looking at some of the financial flows? Um, okay, so um, as probably you all know, we have a new um, sourcing, trading and manufacturing committee, and I'm gonna be moderating a panel exactly on that topic tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so, uh, shameless plug, you better watch it because it is it, like, really, you're going to hear gems and pearls of wisdom. But what do we see with our own clients um, that, um, you know, depending on what they're manufacturing? Right, because most of our clients are small and medium sized business clients. They're either manufacturing or sourcing in China. OK, um, so what does that mean in terms of uh, supply chain? Well, most of our clients, although, you know, a big trend or, or whatever you hear is China plus one. Right. Most of them, while they are exploring outside of China, what they say is that in terms of having the supply chains and the on the ground expertise, 
um, that they have in China, it would take decades to replicate that in, an, in another ASEAN market. So, uh, and, and those that have actually started, you know, they have a lot of lessons learned that they could tell anybody that is uh, thinking to go down that route. But, uh, but regardless, they, they keep their business here because, you know, the, the, even if they've explored China plus one, um, you know, their China is still their main, you know, manufacturing or, supply, or, or sourcing hub. Yeah, we do see uh, companies looking at Eastern Europe because that becomes an easier um, near shoring type um, dis, uh, uh, decision. Okay, I'm going to pause asking questions. A any questions from the floor on any of the topics that we've touched on so far? Please. Tax incentives and, um, you know, set out, making it really easy for um, for, let's say, family offices and, and investment firms to actually set up there. Um, and, um, and then I have a question for, um, <laughs> for you as well. Uh, um, so, you know, how do you see actually, you know, people coming in, as you said, you know, when you chose Hong Kong, did you also consider Singapore? I mean, you know, how do you see, you know, compare, I know you like living in Hong Kong, um, but, you know, from a business point of view, you go first. Okay. Uh, more so, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so how did, so we've lived in Asia for 25 years, okay? So we lived in Japan for 15, we lived here, we've lived here for 10. Uh, so we know Asia pretty well, right? So it's not like we were, you know, doing our research from scratch. Um, and in our experience, just from a personal perspective, uh, Hong Kong is a much more um, vibrant place to live rather than uh, Singapore. So that's personal. But from a um, business perspective, um, it's, it's much, you know, bureaucratically, it's much friendlier, I find, in Hong Kong. You know, in order, like right now, we're permanent residents, but we weren't when we first started our business. And that can be an issue if you try to set up in Singapore and getting employment passes. Um, so... Uh, and also there's the proximity to, to China. So, you know, in terms of SMEs, can I, let me throw out a statistics. There are 340,000 SMEs, small, medium-sized businesses here in Hong Kong that make up 98% of the enterprises that are based here, right? So that's, I think that's a pretty telling um, statistic that this is a great place to run a business. Yeah, maybe I'll give my perspective on the, the sort of um, never ending question of Hong Kong versus Singapore, um, which actually is rarely a question that I get asked by businesses. It's popular in the media, it's popular with politicians, um, but in reality, businesses are looking at opportunities. So the conversation starts with where do you think you've got the commercial opportunity? Is it in Hong Kong as a city? Is it in Singapore as a city? Is it mainland or is it Malaysia or Indonesia? And then that leads you to a more sensible answer about where to locate. Um, in my opinion, um, it's never a binary choice for a business that really has ambition um, for the region. Um, it's probably more a question of sequencing. Where do you open first? But if you have got limited resources, whether human or capital, then I would make a very strong argument that Hong Kong, because of its geographic location um, and its proximity generally to the whole of the region, um, wins out over Singapore. And there's some of the points that Rose was making about the sort of the ease of doing business and so forth. But ultimately, it's horses for courses. But rarely in any conversation that I have with a business, do they start with the location? It's where do I make a buck? How am I going to make a buck? And that then leads you to the sensible answer. So I, I'm sort of very much um, a pragmatist and get drilled down into the practical straight away. Um, you did ask a specific question about um, family offices where Singapore um, has been attracting a large number of family offices. Um, one thing I would say is Singapore has a licensing regime 
um, for family offices. So they've got something that allows them to count the numbers. In Hong Kong, we don't have a licensing regime. And we believe actually the number of family offices in Hong Kong already is well in excess of the number in Singapore. That, that's one thing. Um, secondly, we're just about all that. There's a bill actually with LegCo at the moment, which will introduce a new um, tax regime in Hong Kong or a tax exemption for family offices, which will put Hong Kong and Singapore on a par. Um, we see family offices as a really important part of the ecosystem. It's not just about um, investing in um, whether equity or debt capital markets products. We want to see a slug of the capital going into direct investment, investing in um, early stage companies, particularly in innovation and technology, particularly with a GBA angle. Um, there's a whole interlinkage with Hong Kong as an art center, one of the top three hubs um, for art auctions now globally, um, and also Hong Kong's role as a philanthropic center. Um, so this is an important priority for the government. Um, and you may have seen actually the budget, um, there's further money going into the family office initiative. We've got a dedicated family office team. Um, in, in terms of incentives, um, Hong Kong traditionally has been less a fair, as we all know, although Charles will shortly share with you um, a new bit of government that has been set up that for um, a, a few companies, we may be extending incentive packages, but I won't steal his thunder. Um, but you know, Charles and I are colleagues and work together very closely on it. Okay. I think that's a very legitimate point. I agree. Any other questions at this point? No? Okay. Maybe we can sort of get back to finance and uh, um, Hong Kong's role, obviously, we all know it's um, an important international financial center. It's got this very unique role um, for offshore RMB. Um, Increasingly, we see moves for RMB settlements um, around the world, recent moves um, between China and Saudi around settling um, oil in RMB. Um, but bring it back down to earth for normal businesses. Um, what do you see in terms of the RMB playing a role in the day-to-day -day business? How easy is it to deal with RMB-related issues? What sort of solutions are in the market? Does it make your business more competitive if you quote in RMB? Yeah. So all good questions. Um, so maybe let me start with a little context that we see in the market, right? One, um, around what you just said, there is a de-dollarization trend. Why is there a de-dollarization trend? It's because of, uh, in part, because of US sanctions. And in addition to that, there's a, the RMB is growing as a reference currency here in Asia, right? And, uh, um, and uh, the, the RMB is the fifth largest or the world's fifth largest reserve currency. And that trend is growing, okay? So with that context, um, what do we, what do we advise to our clients? Um, we advise that they transact in the local market, meaning the mainland, in RMB, right? Uh, don't try to uh, transact in US dollars uh, in, uh, in, in a market that has a, a very, you know, influential currency and, a, and an important currency. And one, uh, so why? Okay, so why, first of all, if you transact in RMB, Okay, you can negotiate better prices with your suppliers and manufacturers because they, you know, you can compare apples to apples on the ground and they can't hide their currency buffer, um, et cetera. Okay, so you, so, um, you can, uh, uh, you can get better terms. Okay, um, one thing you might not know is that Hong Kong is set up as a currency risk management hub, right? There is a will. Uh, by the government to make Hong Kong the currency ma risk management hub for greater China. So um, if you're doing, if you are transacting cross-border business, let's say between Canada and China, Hong Kong is a great place to have your Asian 
hub to manage all manner of, uh, of, of things, including your currency risk management, because Hong Kong Futures Exchange has all the instruments that you will need in order to manage that RMB risk. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's what I would say about that. The other thing is, um, uh, around then you have to manage that currency risk. So that's one of the things that we do with our clients. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, Hong Kong is a great, is a great setup for that. You have access to, uh, uh, compared to uh, in Canada uh, in, a very, in a much more cost effective uh, way um, here in Hong Kong, right? So you can do everything offshore Hong Kong and then send your RMB across the border. But you know, for the, the SMEs in the room and online, they might think all of this stuff sounds like it's all for the big boys. Is it accessible to, if you like, most of the companies that operate, whether here in Hong Kong or back in Canada, um, who have limited resources and so forth? Um, well, currency risk management is for anybody who does cross-border business, uh, clearly. Uh, and um, so the research says that only 80% of people uh, of SMEs uh, or only 20% of SMEs do currency risk management. So that means 80% are not managing their currency risk. So what does that do? What is, why should you manage your currency risk? Um, there are two reasons. One, you can improve your profit margin. And the second, it's good corporate governance. So how do you improve your profit margin? One, you can negotiate better um, prices with your suppliers and manufacturers. The second is you can have more competitive pricing with your clients, right? Which means you can gain market share. And the, and the third is that you can uh, uh, um, pocket that currency buffer that you used to take. Right. And then if we talk about corporate governance, so that's the G and ESG, which is very important. If you're not managing your risks, any risk, right, whether that be Ralph cyber security risk um, or currency risk, then when uh, you are looking for financing, right, your bank, venture capital, whatever, um, that will impact the financing options for your company. Uh, in addition to that, if you're looking to sell your company, that's going to adversely impact the valuation of your company. So, some, so, so there you can access these solutions, and that's one of the things that we do. And uh, anybody who's doing cross-border risk should absolutely do that. So, transparently, we have a family business in Canada that transacts between Canada and the U.S. So, currency risk between those two currencies. So, it's an it's an SME firmly in the SME, and we do currency risk management, have to. If we don't, we will wipe out our profit margin. So no point in doing business. Great. Can I totally change the topic? Yes. So um, there's a sort of global deficit of talent. Um, we'd love to see more Canadians coming to work in Hong Kong. What would you say to young Canadians? Well, they don't need to be young, they can be any age, um, about sort of living, working, and playing in Hong Kong. What, what's great about Hong Kong? Okay, so I'm gonna throw this question back to Stephen in a minute, but uh, first, uh, let me ask it. Um, uh, so uh, let's go back to, uh, you know, what, because we are hiring, by the way, uh, as well, and we are hiring offshore. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> and um, so if uh, so, why? What are the considerations that you should look at if you're you know, thinking about coming to Hong Kong? Well, I grew up in Vancouver, as I said, um, but I left for Asia right after university. Right. I've lived in Japan. I've lived in France. I've lived here um, and in Canada. And I love Hong Kong the most, although I love all those places. OK, um, why do I love Hong Kong? So one consideration for people that are, are thinking about coming here is quality of life. OK, so I live in Wan Chai, so I live in one of the most vibrant uh, um, cities in the world. But I can walk out my back door and I'm on Bowen Road in Aberdeen Country Park and I can walk for hours and hours, go for a run, a hike, whatever, um, and stay in beautiful greenery, go down to the beach. Right. That's quality of life. Also, as a working mom, access to helpers here in Hong Kong so that right doesn't that any working mom here isn't that one of like your top uh, you know benefits of working in Hong Kong okay so that's one consideration quality of life right um, the second is that um, uh, if you're stem talent you know that the Hong Kong government has uh, 
um, invested, or the government has invested a lot in making Hong Kong a vibrant, uh, Hong Kong with the Greater Bay Area, so we can talk about the Greater Bay Area, a vibrant technopole. Right, so the largest technopole in the world, larger than Silicon Valley. So the the um, the number that I got was that they've invested over the last four years 130 billion Hong Kong dollars to make this happen. So anybody who's a who's a STEM graduate would want to come uh, to access those myriad of opportunities. And lastly. You know, back to the point that I said before, obviously this is one of the most important financial centers in the world, right? But not only that, this is a, um, this is a mecca for entrepreneurs the, from the stats that I said earlier, right? And why are there so many entrepreneurs here, you know, import, export? Uh, so 46% of those companies I talked about are doing import, export, or some kind of wholesale um, business like, like manufacturing um uh, because of the uh, the low you know the easy to navigate bureaucracy to set up and also the friendly fiscal environment right which is super important if you're an entrepreneur and you're taking risk right so that's uh, that's what i see but uh, so um that's the reason why talent should come what do you think and what are the what's uh, what's invest hong kong doing <laughs> firstly i'm gonna I, i'm gonna dodge the question because we're sort of running up against the clock so I'll, I, I will come back to answer it promise um if not i'll pass it to charles um but any, any other questions for rose it's a great opportunity to pick the brains of somebody who's been there done it got the t-shirt and probably some scars along the way as well mm -hmm. but any other questions for rose Well, we can talk about that in more detail afterwards. We're not really here to talk about me, but I can say that a lot of those banks that you mentioned, they don't actually uh, service the SME market. Yeah. So their, their focus is often on the large cap corporations. So we service those clients that really don't have access uh, to, to those solutions with their traditional financial services firm. So they're looking for an institutional level solution um, that uh, uh, and expertise, uh, and uh, and that's that's what we provide. But we can talk about that afterwards if you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, there's got one at the back. Shane is has a question. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Shane. We're uh, we've recently heard that um, the British Virgin Islands have been placed on the blacklist a threat that was provided to the Hong Kong government not that long ago uh, and reacted to by um, the uh, TCSP licensing of various nominees and trust companies, corporate secretaries, accountants, etc. We recently had the Legislative Council pass a rather intriguing bit of legislation concerning offshore structures as they relate to Hong Kong. My question is, what are we as Invest Hong Kong, etc., doing to protect our rather glorious tax system here? Something that wasn't mentioned specifically in the commentary about Hong Kong, but I mentioned it. Obviously, <laughs> not paying crazy amounts of tax is one of the beacons of Hong Kong and always has been. What are we doing about protecting that against the OECD and other representatives of failed governments around the world? Um, Invest Hong Kong obviously isn't responsible for tax policy, but um, I'll, I'll pick up the OECD point. Uh, many of you might be aware of the BEPS 2.0 um, proposals about, in effect, um, minimum taxation globally. Um, the threshold set is 15%. So actually in the context of Hong Kong, um, it is unlikely um, to have a material impact. Um, I would say that if you look at the policy address, if you look at the budget, um, if you follow what the financial secretary says, I think 
the understanding um, within government and the recognition that our tax system is something incredibly important um, continues to be the case. So I say it's really high up the agenda within government. Um, so I, I, I don't see that being something where we'll see us moving in a backward direction. That, that's my personal view. Charles may want to actually touch on the taxation a, a little bit as well. And I'm very conscious that we've run over time. So I'm going to pass the buck to Charles to talk about some of the stuff that government's doing around talent, um, because it's a, it's a government um, initiative rather than purely an Invest Hong Kong one. So Charles, that's for you. But before we call time, any last question for Rose? Okay, if not, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen okay. and Rosemary. Uh, and, and can I just leave you all with what one sort of um, call for help, if you like. For, the, for those of you in Canada, please come and visit. Come and see it for yourself, because seeing really is believing. And for those of you who have got HQs who might be questioning what's going on on the ground here in Hong Kong, um, encourage them to come and pay a visit. Come see what's happening. And at Invest Hong Kong, we'd help you um, set up programs and so forth to help your HQ colleagues really understand how fantastic the opportunity is right here in Hong Kong. So thank you. <laughs>